Hello, I'm Nick Sutner. I'm here with Doug Wilson. Hello, Doug. Hello. Hello. And uh, we are here to introduce your your big miniseries. Uh, we're, we're doing a Into the Depths sort of thing uh, on the music of uh, the game you made with Duguid Fabrique, uh, Mutaseone. Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what the game is for folks who may not have context? So Mutaseone is a narrative adventure game. Uh, we've called it a mutant soap opera. So it features this ensemble cast of friendly mutants that you meet in this strange village. Uh, and you kind of learn about their various like dramas and also serious issues and, and so forth. And uh, one of the main mechanics of the game are these musical gardens that you grow. So audio and music is like a really big part of this game. Yeah. And uh, specifically, I was uh, the audio programmer I worked a lot on some of the audio systems with our composer, Alessandro Coronas, and I was a general kind of designer on the game as well. Cool. And then I guess uh, we should talk about kind of how uh, it came to be that we're running this on the Eggplant Show. So uh, this is a, quite a surprise to me. Uh, this was not originally supposed to be part of Eggplant. Uh, we uh, So this, this podcast you'll hear is with two... Of, of my many collaborators. So Alessandro Coronas and Nils Dinekin, we'll introduce them coming up. And we were just going to do it kind of half for ourselves to reflect on this long project that we did. Um, and half as like promotion for the game, we were going to host it on our website. I guess I was thinking a lot about podcasts because I already do a podcast with, with Eggplant. Uh, uh, well, I was asking Nick for advice about, well, you know, like, how should I publish it and you know, what, what platforms? And then at some point, I think you were just like, do you want us to publish it? Um, and I, I I often get really kind of self-effacing about some of these things. And so it was like, oh, well, is it like a conflict of interest to, to mix these, these two podcasts? We were originally going to call ours The Radio Tower, which you'll hear in, in the episode, which is like a reference to one of the places in, in the game of Mutacione. Um, but the more we talked about it, um, uh, yeah, just this idea. It happens also to be four episodes. That's that's just a coincidence. Yeah, I mean, you basically had a similar structure to what we'd done with with uh, Noita and um, and Splunky 2, which we've done yeah. so far on Into the Depths in terms of a four-part structure, a deep dive into a single game. And I, I think, you know, you're doing it here on the music of Mutasiano, but you really use that as a lens to discuss the history of the game itself and lots of other bits and pieces. Uh, and there also is a lot of music in the podcast, as you'll hear, which is just, you know, it's an incredible soundtrack. And you guys did um, some, I mean, not just soundtrack, but the the you know, musical gardens in the game that you work with. And there's so many pieces to that. So I think, you know, I will say as well, I mean, I love the music in the game and I love music in general. And you and I have talked about music over the years, but uh, even if the music of a random game you haven't played, it does sounds less interesting to people than some relatively more general stuff we do, even though I suppose we're kind of niche on the whole, I would still encourage people to give it a shot because uh, quickly you will find that I think it's just a uh, really well put together story of the history of the stuff. And I really enjoyed listening to you guys and I immediately loved it. And that's partially why I tried to talk you into uh, letting us put it on the feed. Um, so it might sound even more niche than usual, but I think it's just like an awesome document of something beautiful you guys made so that's great to hear nick i think the thought was uh this actually the podcast is a perfect format to talk about an audio thing because we can literally play the audio and that makes it quite different than talking about the gameplay and noita or um spelunky 2 and we play a bunch of like unreleased tracks and and new tracks as well and yeah. so that, i think that's why the audio was a good fit so it's got a for that reason it has a really different cadence i think and then eggplant but uh yeah yeah uh Give it a listen. Your mileage may vary. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm excited to hear the rest as well. And so we're going to have this going for, you know, on our off weeks for the next uh, eight weeks, four episodes. Uh, this is going to be the first part of that. And we'll have our regular shows uh, in between that. Yeah. So I guess uh, without further ado, you're going to hear a whole lot more Doug because me and uh, Andy and Zach are gone. We'll be on the normal shows. But I'm looking forward to this. Like, it turns out, by the way, you're the better host, which is very frustrating for me. 
I I think we just proved on the stuffed wombat episode that that is not the case. I didn't have to field listener questions on this podcast, which was an important difference. That's true. I will say that's one difference is that we're this is all pre recorded already, so you is we're not going to be sort of engaging with the audience the same way we usually would on an end of the depths. But uh, we also I think kind of have our next one picked out with our our regular crew after this um, starting sometime next year. Um, so yeah, we'll be back with that, and and we'll sort of play along on the Discord. And everything else but yeah. uh, i would encourage people to go and and discuss these episodes as they happen to there's lots to talk about there uh discord.gg slash eggplant show if you haven't joined yet and i can answer questions on the discord or on twitter in the show notes on twitter we'll give um at least alessandro's on twitter so if you have questions i'm sure he'd, he'd be happy to answer them uh, awesome. in that kind of more dialogic way on on twitter awesome cool uh well eggplant and the good of fabric uh present into the depths, the music of Mutazione. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to The Radio Tower, a four-part podcast about the audio and music design of Mutazione, a narrative adventure game that we released in September 2019. I'm Douglas Wilson, a game designer and audio programmer on Mutazione, I'm joined here by Alessandro Caronas, the audio and music designer of the game. Hello. And Nils Denikin, the creative director, lead visual artist, and the originator of the whole concept for the game. Hello. Uh, so uh, we worked on Mutazione for over 10 years on and off uh, with an entire team beyond just the three of us. So there's no way that we can capture the full story of the development on this podcast. Instead, we're going to deep dive into the music of the game, how music initially inspired some of Nils' concepts for the game, how we designed our procedural music systems, what kind of influences the soundtrack draws from, and much more. Uh, We'll also be playing some excerpts of music, including early concepts and drafts that never made it into the final game. Today on episode one, we're going to talk about the early history of the game and its music, uh, and also how Alessandro first got involved in the project. First, to kick things off, let's all listen to an early concept tune from 2009 that never made it into the final game. It's called Intro Theme 2.0. Okay, we're going to talk about that tune a little later when we talk about some of the other 2009 era concepts. Uh, But first, let's talk a little bit about the early history of the game and some of the uh, influences before even this project started. Uh, So let's start with Nils. Hi, Nils. Hello, Douglas. Uh, So Nils, uh, Mutacion is really kind of your baby. Can you tell us a little bit, like, when did you first have 
the idea for this game? Like, how did how did the initial seeds of this game come about? Um, oh, this is really hard to tell because it was really like uh, something that you know slowly kind of builds up in in, in your head. And uh, at the beginning, it was actually more like uh, animation short conceptually. Um, uh, that was even before I got into games, I think. And it kind of distilled. I had this idea about this world that I wanted. It had something to do with a, with an, uh, with a motorcycle accident and a, um, this kind of post-apocalyptic world where this meteor had crashed or not. It wasn't actually a meteor at that point. I think it was a, uh, uh, atomic bomb. So it was like this area where this atomic bomb had hit and it was like mutating uh, environments. And um, it was like a desolated area uh, where nobody would go to. And this person who was on a motorcycle would be, you know, uh, chased by the police into that direction and kind of crash into that old crater. And then after the crash, wake up and make make it's like uh his or her way to to a, a village in the middle of those swamps uh and that village eventually became mutazione um but it was like this kind of place where there were like outcasts living and uh they were like far away from from society and the area was was dangerous and weird and yeah <laughs> Do, do do you remember kind of the rough timeline about when you decide to actually make that into a game and then apply for some local Danish funding to to make an prototype? Um, yeah, it, that was after I actually got into games and I found out that something like indie games existed. Um, I was um, I was studying um, communication design or visual communication. And uh, uh, my my finishing project I sent to to the independent games festival, which I really had no idea uh, what it was back then. And I got picked to that festival and and went to San Francisco. And through that kind of this whole world of indie games opened up for me. And I saw, I mean, like I've always been interested in in games, but I had no idea how I could get into games because uh, like that was not really my background. Um, that was 2008. Um, I applied with Quick Blender and was was taken, and through that kind of all, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, started happening. It was like this domino effect uh, that kind of yeah. So let's let, let's talk briefly about Roik Blender because that's kind of how both me and Alessandro meet you, but. It's also relevant to this podcast because you end up doing, you did the audio and the music for that yeah. that project yourself. Is that right? Yeah, that was the, the, the best part of that project. Um, Tell us a little bit, about, so going back and listening, because I hadn't played that game in a very long time, listening to some of the music. Um, so you're playing like a few different instruments on it. There's some kind of almost like down-tempo jazz, but then also some kind of scarier ambient music. Is that right? And you made all of that music yeah i recorded samples i had a very good idea about what kind of sound universe i wanted to create um i I wanted a lot of those samples to be like like analog um analog percussion uh like wood wooden percussion instruments like stuff you would find in like a school orchestra setting like all those instruments that you had in school that, that you know, like the two sticks you would you know, put together, all those like wooden percussion instruments. Um, I recorded a bunch of those. I took a lot of, uh, recorded a lot of field recordings and samples of creaking noises and stuff like that that would make up the beats. Um, it was kind of inspired, like, uh, while I was thinking about that soundtrack, I discovered this one record by the books um, called Lost and Sa- yeah. Safe. Um, yeah. Amazing record and it kind of like hit me that that was, you know, kind of the direction that I wanted to go. I mean, I was also inspired by other stuff. Um, 
like uh, boards of Canada and stuff like that. This kind of like the, the you know these beats that kind of are a little lazy. Maybe the the, the beat comes in a bit too late, or uh, and you know you, in Rückblend you basically have two two times because it's like a flashback. So you have this character that kind of goes back into his childhood and the music always has a shift when you when you go back in time and look at the past and it's like different when you're in the present where everything the hut that you're visiting is kind of uh, fallen apart and it's a bit sadder so just a quick summary of the game concept so this is kind of like a pretty like a short narrative adventure game that yeah you're in this forest and then you go back and see these kind of memories you you actually kind of film the whole world in a huge diorama sculpture that you actually sculpted yeah in the right it was a, right? a model that i built and it was taken you know every every frame of the the um, the area was taken with a with a camera and like it's like a stop and, motion and then you draw you draw like little animations of the characters on top of of the, yeah. these like photos. Of when the when the, when the yeah. memories kick in, you always see the characters animated on top of it with really simple um, drawings uh, and animations. Um, so we'll we'll come back to this game a little bit because I know both me and Alessandro were like super impressed by this game, um, and that like kind of it was a little bit kind of how we met you. But okay, so you. You work on this student project. You kind of get into the world of indie games. You start thinking more about this concept for this like swamp town of these mutants, Mutacione. Um, can you tell us a little bit about? Because I know, like me, you and Alessandro, Alessandro talk a lot about bands we like and our kind of musical influences for our like game design and the world building. So, as like an avid listener of music, I guess like the bands you listen to, the music you listen to. That that seems to be like a big reference and inspiration, even for the the world building of the game. Is that right? Definitely. Like, um, I think I'm, especially during that time, and probably also now, um, uh, music is definitely the, the thing that inspires me most. Like when I listen to music, I you know I just get images in my head, um, and that kind of creates those universes. So if there's some music that really speaks to me then then i you know directly have a really clear image in my head and for for one of the tracks that i could reference as, mm. as one of the in- images for the town of mutazione at the beginning when you you know before i came up with it was definitely tom waits um clap hands from um rain dogs uh you know really great album um and for some of the environment, it was from a German band um, called Zuckertronic. Mm. Um, there's a track called Harmonie ist eine Strategie. Uh, that really kind of, also the text universe really created this head of this kind of uh, character, you know, going down that river band and the colors of it. And, and you know, uh, that really kind of um, was me visualizing that song, basically. Um, can I ask is, uh, cause I know, uh, the, the TV show Twin Peaks is obviously like an inspiration for you and for me. And you can see a little bit of that in the, in the final game. Uh, when I was, went back and listened to Roy Blender and some of your earlier work, I almost felt like the music there was a little, um, Twin Peaksy, that kind of like, uh, spooky, but interesting down tempo jazz with like a little sense of humor to it. Was that, was that another explicit musical reference for you or not not so much more the the story it was definitely for that intro sequence uh you know in the menu of quick blender you saw those you know like fir trees and that was directly hooked from from twin peaks that image of the wind going through the forest and you know this this kind of okay something's happening in twin peaks and there's the soapy stuff and then you would see the the trees waving in yeah. the wind and you would hear the music coming in uh angelo badalamenti's uh those deep yeah. sound uh, deep yeah um synths and you would know okay something is going on in the forest and something is like going what? yeah something wrong is going on here 
was Badalamenti also an influence for Mutaciones early world or, or a little, less, little so? less? I think. I mean, like, mm. yeah, no, no, that was a thing. Definitely, Rick Blender had at very clear Twin Peak references. I think mm. in Mutazione, in terms of like the whole soap opera setting, um, that it became much later on. Uh, there, you you could definitely see a Twin Peak reference, but less in terms of the the mood. Uh, and more about like the the way that you know characters interact um, um so okay so we know you've done music your own music and audio for one of your other games and you like clearly had all of these like pretty specific music influences that were really inspiring um your work uh, and to be clear uh you your main job on mutazione and in, in, in addition to being the creative director and the originator of the concept you drew like all of the backgrounds and the characters right you were so you were the the um the vis- the main visual mm. artist on the game so so maybe let's try to like let's like slowly bring in alessandro right now so if you had done music uh for an old game why not why not do music for mutazione like what kind of led you to to think about working with another musician to to do the music for the game well i think that i was definitely lacking that level of professionalism uh, I mean, if I if I could do it, I would definitely love to do it because I seriously like when I did music for Rick Blender, it was the best thing about the project. It took like all mm. the other aspects of the game were like really tedious and and like horrible. It took me a long time, way longer than <laughs> I anticipated. But the music just flew out of my fingers, kind of. It was like uh, mm. I used like. You did this along other stuff within two months and it was done. It was good. I, I really loved the process. It was the best, best part of it. I it only did that, you know, the project to have an excuse to make music. Um, so wow. like, yeah, and I, if, if I could choose a profession besides what I'm doing, it would definitely be that. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit envious of Alessandro. But okay. So uh, let's get Alessandro into the timeline, into the scene. So uh, Alessandro, how how do you come across uh, Nils and his work, and how do you get involved in the project at this point? Yeah, so one day I was flipping through the pages of this video game magazine that I used to buy, and there was this small article towards the end about this free game called Rook Blende. And like the, there was like a little screenshot from the game world, and... It wasn't made with computer graphics. It was made by hand. Like, it looked to me. So I went down in the studio right away. I downloaded the game, and I played it, and I stopped playing after a couple of minutes, and I was like, okay, I want to do stuff with this guy. I don't know who he is, but in the game's package, you would find, like, a PDF with Neil's email at the very bottom. So I started making this piece of music for him because like sending an email stating like yeah i would like to do stuff with you it's just not interesting like yeah who who are you like what do you do so i made this little piece in like 20 minutes it wasn't anything like memorable for me i just uh i didn't have anything to work on and the only thing that i had like well it was like this this wonderful scenery from the website. You mean the the yeah the main Gouda Fabrique picture of the fact the factory yeah. at the blue sky on the on the cliff. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I did that. I just simply stared at the picture and just let my hands go without thinking too much. And that was it. <laughs> that that's how it all wow. like started for me. Um yeah. Let's let's take a listen to that original uh track that you email cold email to him and then we'll discuss it. Um, so here is, uh, and what did you call it at the time? Um, here I have it labeled uh, Nils Piece yeah. One. Yeah, yeah, Nils uh, Piece One. Let's let's take a listen to this.
Okay, so by the way, I love that piece of music. I only I only heard that yeah. years later. But but Nils, let's let's take you back. So this is like kind of early two thousand eight. You get this email out of the blue from this Italian guy, I guess, right? With this piece of music attached to it. So what's like what's your reaction? Yeah, I was at this point? to be I was blown away. Like I really love that track. And I really that's like if I had had an uh, like a kind of uh, uh, mood in my head for the music that would have been it for for the homepage uh, for the image. Um, I really love the whole um, universe he builds up with with those this kind of spaciousness, uh, this like daring to leave, yeah, to to leave room in there. Uh, really love that. Uh, so yeah, I was like, okay. Uh, I want to work with this guy. That's like so. So let's talk about that. So even okay. So you like I guess it's two thousand nine when you hand in this prototype for the uh, on the on the mm-hmm. grant. Is that right? But even even before the actual formal prototype that you make, Alessandro pretty soon after getting in touch with you starts sketching possible music for the game. Is that right? Yeah, because we had. We had concepts from the game, like we had environments uh, that are concepted, like uh, also from the town and the inhabitants. Um, the the funny things, none of those environments actually made it into the prototype, uh, but uh, Alessandro did concept some uh, some uh, pieces for uh, for those early concept sketches and besides making the music for the for the prototype that the prototype was basically a dream sequence um of before you would start the game okay so at this point alessandro you have even early on these like pictures and concepts of some of the old characters some of the uh, possible places in the town um can you talk a little bit about that like process of taking this artwork that before anything is even playable this artwork these concepts that you have from nils and like some of the like early ideas for what the music would sound like yeah it was a really straightforward process nils would send me pictures sketches uh he gave me a game design doc and that was really useful because i could read everything about the backstory and the characters and that was Super inspiring because for me, it's always about what excites me about making music is just make music for something else, make music for a scene or a character or like a moment in the story. So, and even though it wasn't and nothing was playable by then, I was already a envisioning and hearing music in my head. So that was a really yeah inspiring time for me, like the very early stages. Are there were there particular genres or like timbers or instruments that were that you were like focusing on early on? Yeah, I mean, it was in a, a tropical environment, so you could definitely tell that. So I was thinking about you know slide guitars, vibraphones, Fender Rhodes, because Neil's drawings always have this sense of this wonderful sense of brokenness and kind of lo-fi in a way, like. And so, and I wanted to reflect that. Uh, and because for me, you know, my goal is always translating to sounds and timbers what I'm seeing so that you perceive them as one, like it's one single thing. That's, that's always been like my only, <laughs> my only goal when making sounds for visuals. Um, let's, uh, let's, play one of these early concept pieces and then we can talk about it um let's play uh this is from 2009 uh the swamp town theme Thank you. 
Okay, so Alessandro, tell us a little bit about what we just listened to. So it's got a lot of similarities to what the uh, soundtrack of the game ended up becoming, but I guess it's also different in some ways. Like, how would you, like, what stands out to you listening to this really early concept? This is still, nowadays, one of my favorite pieces that I ever made for the game. Even thinking about the final soundtrack. And I, I, there's not a particular reason. I, I don't know. I just like everything about this piece. Uh, and it, it's, it's one of the very early sketches, sketches. It might be the third or the fourth that I've ever done. And, but still, nevertheless, I still like it uh, up to this day. Yeah. Yeah, it's really nice to listen to again, actually. I haven't heard this for a long time. But it, it definitely captures the mood of, uh, and and still does. Like it's it's funny how like some of the old stuff really kind of survived. Like, yeah, um, the the development and and it still has this kind of spirit. I can hear all, all kinds of directions that that went into this. Like uh, there's this kind of Tom Waits ish feeling, the swamp feeling. There's like and there was one thing that I didn't mention before, but one thing I tried to to um, uh, push and was this kind of uh, genre of of zombie surf that I wanted to have in in the the soundtrack. This kind of dark surf music, um, and um, and I can totally hear Alessandro being influenced by by Tortoise here as well. Uh, yeah, you can hear that that sound of the guitar. It's like from TNT, uh, which has yeah. some, some really beautiful summary songs in there, and the, the harmonies. Um, yeah, it's it's a beautiful track. So you at at this point, even Nils, uh, would you call it giving direction, or are you? Like, it, it's not just Alessandro going off by himself, like and looking at the drawings. You also kind of talked about possible music references for the soundtrack. Is that right? I th- Definitely think there was a communication going on and like what direction we wanted this to go. Yeah, I mean, that was one of my favorite parts of the early stages of the development. Like getting emails from you and say like, yeah, listen, listen to this because I really love this atmosphere. And for me, it never really felt like a like like you were like limiting my freedom. Mm. On, on the other hand, I was like super happy to get those emails and just be challenged. Yeah, it was a f- control freak like uh, in terms of music i was like hey i want this like listen to this it should sound more like this or like uh this doesn't really hit that that tone like yeah. try listening to this again or like um I was, I was really obsessive about the sound and what kind of sound this was supposed to be and yeah but can i tell you something i mean this is meant to be like that um besides the fact that what that was your game what I really liked about Rook Blender was your soundtrack. It really blew me away, and it's a really rare thing for me. So that some, something like a music makes me go like, what is this? Right. So I was really eager to get your emails with like your inspiration pieces, like, like, I like this vibe. And I would usually listen to that piece and go like, wow, super nice. I really like this too. So that was the, yeah, that was super obvious for me. I, I found out at, at some point, because at some point you kind of get into the flow of working together that, you know, you have to let go a lot of about a lot of that stuff and trust each other. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah. think that's a lesson I learned along, along the way on the project, especially when the team got larger. Um, but it's, you know, it's this back and forth. It's, it's kind of giving up control slightly and let the project have the life by itself. And I think we're going to get back to that later when we talk about this how how, how, you know we're gonna see that happen i also think it's a double-edged sword that both me and you nils and we both worked really closely with alessandro throughout the project um are both also like really avid music listeners and have all sorts of opinions and tastes and whatever in music and so the good news is the three of us are constantly sharing references and really talking through those on like a deep level I guess the bad point is like, like you're saying at some point you can only 
talk about that so long at some point we have to like trust alessandro and his vision for the for the music of the game yeah exactly and i think both you and me doug we are also both control freaks yeah. creatively <laughs> or, or maybe actually maybe this got better yeah. Uh, yeah along the last couple of years but we were the at the beginning we were like both really like <laughs> yeah um, can, can i add a little story to this um both you and Doug share like a lot of musical, you know, tastes, and like say seventy percent of it, you listen to the same stuff. But at some point, you kind of deviate, and there's some stuff that you would listen to, and there's some other stuff right. that Doug would listen to. Right. And this has been a bit of a problem for me, like in the yeah early stages, because. I would come up with a piece and Nils would say, oh, I love this. And and Doug would say, right. yeah, <laughs> not really. And and of course, this was kind of stalling, creating a stall. And remember, like in the later stages, I proposed, okay, from now on, Nils has the last yeah. word. So we can just keep going because time was running out. And because music is really personal. Yeah. Because right? you, yep. you vibe with the song mm-hmm. in a really personal way. And... And for me, also was like a composing was like solving a Rubik's cube because I had to Nils would come up with a piece and say like I really like this vibe, and I had to recreate that vibe, right? Uh, of course, by doing something completely different. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's been like challenging at times, uh, but it's also been like super fun. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, we we won't play let all of the all of the full clips but obviously there's a ton of sketches like it was really fun over the last few weeks like you two unearthing your like treasure trove of influences and uh, uh unreleased music so you also did a few character themes for these early characters uh many of which didn't even make it into the final game um there was this one piece that the three of us were talking about before the show for this uh character called robotron nils who is robotron again so yeah, that's just the the whole concept of the game was different. So you would you would you know be this character that had a motorcycle crash and land in this weird mutated area that was nuked ages ago, and you know life had mutated in different ways. And at some point, it was you know you as a character, you were actually uh, it was all like. A parallel world you, that you got transported into, and yet you had to find your way home. So, Mutazione, the the town in the middle, was supposed to be this hub world where you would meet characters, and from there you would collect hints and and go into different levels, right? Because it's a platforming game. And and once of one of the levels um, was the old junkyard. Uh, so the old junkyard was this this. Um, yeah, basically this big junkyard with like a lot of fantastic junk, right? Uh, it had like all broken down space shuttles and airplanes and, mm. and it was huge. And, uh, and the end part, and you had to get some information from that was the Robotron, uh, was the head of this giant robot. Nils, can I ask you something? Mm-hmm. Like, why was he sad? Because I named it Sad Robotron Tape, but I can't remember why he was sad. Well, he was sad because he had failed his uh, objective of of preventing the meteor or the nuke to happen. Ah, okay. Um, we have this old demo tune. It's like three minutes long or whatever. Sad Robotron Tape. Do you want to tell us a little bit? Of, do you remember doing that, Alessandro? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I... Have in the back of my head, I remember that I made this sad Robotron tape, which I really liked because I always thought it was like super expressive. But yeah, um, I don't really remember when I did that yet. <laughs> right, like that's that's how long the project was slash how old some of these concepts are. That's like <laughs> yeah. a distant memory of of assets concepts produced over a decade ago. Yeah, let's just listen to it and then talk about it afterwards. I'm really curious. Okay, let's let's we weren't planning on, but that's 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 okay. We can we can do it. We'll go a little longer. Let's see how this goes.
Okay, so let's let's keep moving on through this kind of uh, history. So even though this is a really old concept um, uh, that you know we worked on this game for for many years, also with the rest of the team, uh, you we weren't none of the three of us were working on this full time that whole decade, right? So there are, there are other projects that we work on in various combinations um, over the years. Uh, one of those uh, games that you make in those kind of interceding years, Where's My Heart? Um, Alessandra, do you remember balancing uh, that soundtrack with like work that you're slowly doing on Mutazione in the background? Like, how much do you remember about doing multiple projects in those days? Uh, I don't know. It's been like supernatural. Um, where, where's my heart has a like a cheap tune ish like soundtrack, but I've used like a lot of gu- acoustic guitars, like real guitars in it. I've used a lot of small, tiny percussions that I would play, like record and play. Uh, all the backgrounds are like based on real field recordings. It, it was it wasn't really that different. I mean, the, the games are super different but i don't know it's just my usual way to do things but using like real instruments real recordings with synthesis and synthesizers yeah and uh, you know bouncing from project to project it never really felt uh, unnatural for me it was just i don't know just super easy yeah Right, so there's there's still some themes kind of like across the games of like combining real quote, real instrument performance with these kind of synthetic sounds, I guess. Um, so a few other projects. So I I end up actually joining De Gute Fabrique in 2012. Uh, I met Nils in 2008 at Indiecade. Uh, uh, this is like October in uh, when Indiecade that its first year was in Seattle. Uh, and we were a team from Denmark, uh, the Copenhagen Game Collective, uh, showing our game, Darkroom Sex Game. Nils was there showing Roik Blenda. And we were like, wait, there's another person from Copenhagen here? Who are you? And then um, got to know Nils. I was living in Copenhagen at the time. Right. I, I guess it wasn't called the Copenhagen Game Collective at that That's point. right. Because That's that right. was founded That's later. right. So, so the, some of the people who would go on to be part of that collective, we had made this game together. Um it's, it's, it's actually, like, I always sometimes think, oh, God, like, we worked on this game, Mutasione, for a decade, like, what we were doing. Well, actually, we worked on a bunch of other projects that decade. Uh, another one of these was a small game for these, like, they, I don't think they exist any longer, but the Siftio Cubes, they were these kind of, like, digital physical toys uh, that had, like, motion control and a, and a small screen on each cube you could play with. So we made a little physical game for that called Tower No Tumble, uh, Nils, you did a little bit of the art for that. I did some of the game design. Alessandra, you did uh, uh, the music and the audio. Um, I guess a, a fun connection here is the game actually features the dots. The, the characters, the dots, make a... Uh, so they're, they're actually in a game before Mutazione is ever released. Right. Uh, it's actually the, the debut of Mutazione. That's right. That's part of the extended Mutazione universe. The, the yeah. Uh, right. The deepest cut, I think. Um, probably a game that almost no one played. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, Mutatsuna is actually just the sequel. To That's Tower. right. <laughs> we should we should have just called it Tower No Tumble 2. <laughs> You're right. Um, uh, the, the reason I bring all of this up, I just to me, part of the narrative of Mutasione and you know, also doing the music for the game is the fact that like uh, that it was such a slow burn, but partly because the three of us in different combinations were working on other game projects together during that time. Um, and you know, that's not, it, that's not necessarily unrelated. Like obviously that gives us more time to learn to collaborate and meet each other and kind of work out these different styles of working together. So, um, you know, those, some of those projects kind of keep us afloat in those, uh, uh, earlier earlier years. Yeah. Um, but wait, why don't we just listen to the Tower No Tumble theme? Yeah, because the drum beat from that theme is inspired by a song of a Danish band called Mimas. And for all you listeners out there, go and check that out on YouTube. The song is called Soda Pop Stalkers, and it's a super nice, cute little song. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, let's let's listen to this. The main theme from a game we made for some Siftio cubes, Tower No Tumble. So 
So uh, the reason this is, as we mentioned, is relevant to Mutasione is because the character is the little character on each cube is one of these dots that are these adorable creatures that are in the final game. Um, and you can you can hear it, especially in some of the other bits of music and sound effects from that game. Uh, these clips, that kind of little high pitched pitter patter um, of the dots, it's kind of similar to the direction that they take in the final game. Um, so uh, to the point, Nils, do you remember drawing that banner image for the game uh, where there's some kids playing it, but instead of rendering it as cubes, you just rendered them as actual dots in that drawing? Right. Um, this was, yeah, this was already part of the Mutazione universe and backstory. Um, Kai was younger. Like, it's actually Kai on yeah, that image. Yeah, like the girl in that picture is Kai. Yeah, yeah, with her little brother and they're playing Dot Dot Shuffle. Um, <laughs> I don't know why she's never been to Mutazione at that point. Uh, right. Maybe the backstory was different. Uh, and it has this kind of 70s sports uh, game kind of style. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, like all these projects in different ways, kind of floating around Mutasione, which is slow baking in the background. So speaking of which, it's not like uh, we're kind of working on that on and off in spurts. And so around that time, like 2012, between 2015, before we really pick up production in a really serious way, there are tons and tons of other music sketches uh, and uh, little experiments that Alessandro does. So we have this huge kind of treasure trove of, of music from back then. Um, so why don't we talk about some of that? Uh, to, to start off, let's play this piece. Um, Electro Tropical Cowboys is what you called it, Alessandro. Do you remember what year this is from? 2013, roughly, I think. Okay, so 2013. So this is still a number of years after the original playable that we uh, did with an art grant from Danish Film Institute, or I didn't at the time, Nils, Alessandro, and their team did. Um, and uh, you're still, uh, over the years, making concepts for the music of this game. Let's listen to uh, this concept, Electro-Tropical Cowboys. Alessandro, do you remember what what was that music supposed to be set to? Was that like a proposed theme for the game or for a particular character? I don't remember exactly. Uh, it could be either like a main theme sketch or a town music sketch. But it, I mean, if I have to place a bet, I would probably say like some main theme, intro theme. Yeah, I guess. Wow. Nils, do you, do you remember listening to this sketch back in the day? I do remember it. I could imagine that it was something with the town music or just the general like mood of walking around in, in the town. Um, so, yeah. so there's clearly some linkages to where the soundtrack would eventually go. Again, that kind of like mix of real instruments and the real kind of lazy swamp feel. Um, but there's also kind of this, like, I feel like aesthetic direction at this point in time that we end up moving away from um, in the final game. Do you do you both feel that way as well? Like, how would you say what we listen to is kind of, how does that differ than where the where the music direction ended up going? 
I think it's um, so. What you the the vibe that you get from the the piece that we just heard was like very kind of tropical cliche Hawaiian. Uh, it's like you're on holidays, right? And you're sipping a, a cocktail in the sunset. <laughs> um, and I, I don't think that was really the the direction that we wanted. Like, um, I imagine mutazione is something that is more like more broken, but also not as much of a I don't know what you call it, like a like a cliche. Um, and I, I I felt that this kind of music would like do the place disservice in some way. Mm. I mean, it's a lovely track, uh, but it's just not really catching the vibe. And um, and I, I know like one of my very early direction was this kind of okay, we want this kind of s zombie surf like uh, vibe. Um, but it, that felt more dark to me than this. Um, and, but we, we moved away from this kind of this very kind of American feel of what, you know, the swamp could be or what right. like. Yeah. Alessandro, wh what do you, what do you think listening to this track now? Um, man, I mean, it was a little too obvious. Um, hmm. It, it was nice, but it was lacking that kind of yeah weirdness and brokenness that the game has, you know. Uh, so, I mean, I, I still like it, but it was a bit too much in your face, mm. you know. Um, recalling like a tropical vibe, or I consider this piece more like a a, a step towards the destination. So we kept the tropicality of it, but this was actually yeah, a little too obvious. Say. So that's that's one, I think, aesthetic that you were really playing around with at the time. That Then for those reasons, we uh, gravitate a little away from. Uh, let's play a second piece. And in some ways, I think really summarizes the vibe of a lot of the music at the time, but also a, I think a direction that we ended up moving away from a little bit. So here's... Here's a piece that you titled A Story. Um, do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about it before we listen to it? When, when was this piece from? Do you remember? I think it was 2015 because I remember George was still in the team. And I mean, I mean this piece is still a mystery to me because <laughs> it's a, yeah, whatever. It's a nice theme. But when I submitted that to you, you all went like, oh, my God, man, you just eat something right there. It's super nice. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> it was too cheesy. And I'm actually glad that we moved away from that. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I have to correct you on that after we listen to this. But like, <laughs> right. let's listen to this. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, a, a story. Let's listen. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'll admit, I think I was the one at the time, if I remember correctly, who was yeah. like, oh, yeah, you're really hitting something. That's it. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I have to admit, we were just all laughing about this track. I, I feel a little em em embarrassed for having thought that. Like, it's obviously, uh, to me, uh, now, in, uh, not not a fit for the game. It's, um, it's so, like, conciliatory. Uh, you, you, do, yeah. I, I, do you, have you ever watched Scrubs? It's like Zach Braff having right. a voice over over this kind of song. Oh no! And, uh, so, you know, just just saying something, you know, wrapping up the episode and saying saying something that everyone has learned something, right? Like we we could use this for the last day of the game where Kai walks around and you know just talks to herself and you know like uh, wraps up the episode basically. Yeah. Um very early 21st century i feel like there's like um we were talking about there's like some suf john stevens it feels like a little bit in there yeah. uh um so alessandro you were despite having composed this you were immediately skeptical of it is that right well i was mostly puzzled because you were all so happy and and for me it was i don't know i liked it but yeah it was just what well but nils Nils claims that he wasn't, so maybe that I, was no, just. I, I really liked it. I, I knew it wasn't a good fit, <laughs> but I, yeah. I, I really liked it. Who, who couldn't yeah. like this tune? I mean, come <laughs> on, it's uh, it's a, it's beautiful and it's yeah. amazing. it makes you feel warm around your heart. But and, yeah. So a couple of things. I, it definitely is more cheerful and optimistic than the final soundtrack, which I think really em embraces. And also, right, like especially bringing Hannah. Uh, the narrative designer and the writer on board. I mean, the story in the world also kind of became a little darker and sadder. And so, uh, you know, over the years, I think, which is great that the, the eventual soundtrack kind of um, matched that as well. Um, th there was that was a banjo at the end of that track. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it's a banjo. Uh, it's a real banjo because I remember Nils mentioning the banjo a little too often. Yeah, back then. So. Yeah, mm. am I right, Niels? Yeah, we 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 were because th we wanted to have this kind of swampy feeling, and the the banjo would kind of because it had this the South uh, States kind of vibe yeah. to it, the swampy feeling, and yeah, we moved away from that at some point, but you know that was an attempt to kind of recreate that kind of f feel of being you know in these swamps. Uh Alessandro, is there any banjo in the final soundtrack? There isn't, is there? No, no, no. Because I borrowed the banjo from a friend of mine, Alessandro, for like a month. And then I had to give it back. So I just used it in that, you know, time frame. And, but yeah, yeah then I have to give mm. it back to him. So, yeah. <laughs> So th that's why the banjo <laughs> never made it. Uh, that's the real reason. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. That's the reason. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I, I'm glad. I, I love the banjo as an instrument, but I'm glad your friend needed his banjo back. Yeah. <laughs> There's no banjo in any of the garden plants as well. No, 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 no banjo. Um, yeah, I mean, I had to give it back, so yeah. So that was it. And after that, he was like, "You'll never get it back." <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alessandro, you asked us this question while we were preparing for the show. And maybe you can ask it again and ask it to yourself, which was, um, do you wish that any of these old themes uh, could have made it into the final soundtrack? No. Uh, <laughs> no. No. No, no, because, uh, so, you know, the songs by then were way more polished, uh, a little too happy for no reason. Uh, and the final soundtrack is so much more wobbly lo-fi a little darker mm. and it's a much much better fit and i think nils agrees on this uh, i totally agree i think um and i don't th think we're gonna get through all of those songs and we're going to talk more about the town music and some of the development so we're going to get back to this in one of the later episodes but uh i think what you can already hear from those examples that uh, the the melodies were very clear. I th also thought they were very predictable and and a bit too mundane, like a bit dull, maybe. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I was I was yeah. like they were they're pretty pleasing 
uh, but it's not like really we didn't want pleasing. Yeah. Um, and also we didn't want those those songs to be to to bore you after mm. like you've listened to them. Yeah, because uh, I mean those melodies times. were super strong. So um, yeah, so. I think there's a good lesson here too, like talking about this with you two, because I think I constantly, and luckily I was not the creative director, thankfully, because I would often give Alessandro feedback where like, I like some of these interest, uh, intro pieces like, oh yeah, this is a really memorable melody. Um, you know, it'd be great to have these, some memorable songs and theme, not, you know, the very subjective definition of what memorable can mean. I think at the time I met kind of these hummable melodies um, and yeah, I you know always I think always trust your audio designer, your musician. I'm, I'm really glad that Alessandra had a kind of um, uh, criticality to be like, wait, no, maybe this isn't actually. Even though you, like somebody like me immediately liked some of that output, saying that might not actually be the best fit for this thing that we're making. Yeah, um, I mean during the development, uh, you were definitely more eager to hear like memorable melodies uh, as mm -hmm. opposed to me and Nils where. We would more we were more on the same page and instead of melodies we yep. were more yep. fascinated by recreating like an atmosphere as opposed to a melody yep. to yep. sing along to. Yep. I think around that time when when we were working on the game, also another round of grant money, and when these melodies came up and we tried to keep working on, on what what is the, the main theme of the game. And when some of that was written, I think a lot of the influence were also coming from Animal Crossing because I remember you were listening to that that soundtrack at that point. Yeah. And it's obviously Animal Crossing is great, and but it's also a yeah. very different mm -hmm. game and a very different kind of vibe. Yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of the discussion was about memorability and and you know where Animal Crossing really has these kind of memorable memorable uh, yep. tunes. Um, so, so I think I'm hearing a lot of the influences from that in, in, in those, in, in that yep. phase in the music. Um, yeah. Can I add one last thing? Yeah. And what I love about Animal Crossing, hmm. Wild World, by the way, not the last one, is how atmospheric the music is because of its simplicity. Um, because, I mean, during the gameplay, you in Animal Crossing, you do pretty much the same thing day in, day out. And the music mm. leaves you a lot of space to kind of immerse yourself, like, and feel yeah. the game world. Uh, and because for me, it's hard to feel the whole game world if I'm distracted by a super strong melody or, like, my ears are, like, super busy with a super rich piece of music. So Animal Crossing, for me... Kind of set a reference that was really important mm. and back in the it was like 2007 when i first played that and it's really like everything starts with a subtraction for me yeah. right yeah no important lesson there not to make your uh it's almost like cooking right yeah. not to make things too rich like you need to give some some space yeah exactly uh, mm. uh excellent so a lot of uh uh obviously um, stuff to talk about still. So uh, in a, some later episodes, we'll talk about where the town music ends up developing from there. Uh, it ends up getting a little bit more procedural. I get involved with programming and helping Alessandro uh, go through different iterations of the town music. Uh, there's all sorts of special music throughout the game in addition to the town music. Uh, that's the kind of music that makes up the huge soundtrack of the game. But uh, what we're going to spend next episode on is the garden music. So we haven't even begun to talk about that much today, um, but there are these, uh, it's one of the key kind of mechanics or features of the game, these magical gardens that you plant with plants. Each species plays a different instrument and there's a whole kind of world of procedural music and designing that kind of system. So that's what we're going to spend um, episode two on, um, the procedural musical gardens. We'll be posting all four episodes of this podcast, The Radio Tower, to the Gouda Fabrique blog, releasing each new episode bi-weekly. 
On the blog, we've also linked to some goodies related to this episode, including Spotify playlists from both Alessandro and Nils, in which they share their own musical influences on the world of Mutazione. They're a treasure trove of excellent music recommendations, so don't miss them. Find all of this info at gutefabrique.com or follow us on Twitter at gutefabrique. That's G-U-T-E-F-A-B-R-I-K. See you next episode.